you will hear a number of different recordings and you will have to answer questions on what you hear. There will be time for you to read the instructions and questions and you will have a chance to check your work. All the recordings will be played once only. The test is in four sections. At the end of the test, you will be given 10 minutes to transfer your answers to an answer sheet. Now turn to section one. Section one. You will hear two colleagues, Mike and Jane, discussing the need for new equipment in their office. First, you have some time to look at questions one to six. Now we shall begin. You should answer the questions as you listen because you will not hear the recording a second time. Now listen carefully and answer questions one to six. Hi, Jane. You mentioned that we might need some new equipment in the office. Absolutely. What we've got is too old and much of it is faulty. Well, you know how difficult it is to replace equipment. I guess I'll just use another requisition form. We can fill it out now. If you don't mind. I suppose you're going to complain about the printer again. Sure, my printer's bad, but the copier is almost unworkable. It jams all the time, it's too slow, and it's already been repaired four or five times. We've got to do something about it. OK, I'll put that down on the form. So you want a copier, not a printer. And you work in accounts, right? Yes, that's right, the accounts department. OK, but this is a requisition form. There's meant to be a limit on the length of time you can have the item. We need it forever. The old machine's almost useless. The moment it gets repaired, it breaks again. Well, I'll just write ongoing, OK? That basically means the item will stay with us until I say otherwise. Now, the next question is, when do you want it? In a few days? One week? It usually takes a while for these things to arrive. If it arrived today, it would be better. We need it as soon as possible. Can you write today? Well, it can't come that quickly. I'll just write immediately. But be warned, that means it may still take some time to get here, perhaps a day or two. That's annoying. We've got so much unexpected demand right now. Good. I'll write that as one of the reasons. We need three reasons, you know, or they won't grant this request. So for the second reason, I'll write original broken. And that's essentially true. It is broken. The truth is always good. But can you think of one more reason? Not really. But those first two reasons are surely strong enough, aren't they? Well, I think we still need a third reason. Maybe I'll have to bend the truth a bit. I'll just write, uh, require more functions. OK? Or you could write, require faster speed. No, all these copiers operate at the same speed, so that reason won't sound true. OK, whatever it takes. Right. And shall I put your name? Jane Huang, spelt with a U, right? Well, actually, I would say your name would be more likely to get speedier results. All right. I certainly don't mind putting my name with this. Mike Green. G R E. Just like the colour green, right? But with that final E, which often tricks people. Yes, that E at the end tricks them all the time. Before you hear the rest of the conversation, you have some time to look at questions 7 to 10. Now listen and answer questions 7 to 10. Actually, Jane, talking about office equipment needed, I've got a list before me of all the items purchased last year. There's certainly a lot and I can see why the owners are getting concerned. 
Obviously, some things are necessary in the business, like the twenty boxes of copying paper I've just ordered. And it shows here that last year our office ordered two fax machines, which is certainly not excessive, but there's a lot of other equipment on this form which may raise questions. Yeah, but we had special circumstances, Mike. We renovated the office and had to replace all the computers and printers. Seventeen, I think. We actually got the printers from another department, so it didn't cost us. But sure, with seventeen people all needing computers, that was a considerable expense, along with the fifteen speakers and sixteen headphones. Why did we need those? Everyone was using Skype to communicate with clients. They still do, of course. It's a very popular way to communicate. And we have six items here as well. Printers? But you said we got them from another department. No, mobile phones, paid for by the company. I remember that for our agents out in the field. They used to use landline phones belonging to the clients. Okay. We also ordered lots of lighting equipment, but that can be expected. I'm not worried about that. Twenty-seven lamps and over thirty-four fluorescent lights. And we needed thirteen new mouses as well to replace some of the old ones. All of the replacement computers had screens, very nice screens, but some of them lacked mouses. Well, at least it wasn't thirteen fans like the marketing department has just asked for. All right. So basically, the amount of equipment ordered last year was quite considerable, but it was all necessary. That is the end of section one. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now turn to section two. Section two. You will hear a representative from Easy Travel Travel Agency telling some customers the details of a planned trip to Arthur Island. First, you have some time to look at questions eleven to fifteen. Now listen carefully and answer questions eleven to fifteen. All right, hello everyone. Now you're all here to learn about the trip to Arthur Island. As you might know, the population is about seven thousand. That's permanent residents. A far cry from the early days when some seventeen thousand people lived there. But the advantage of a declining population is that the island has maintained its natural attractions. So now, in the summer, the population swells to twenty-two thousand as tourists flock to this lovely little place to enjoy all it has to offer. It's an interesting fact that Arthur Island was once very isolated, with only a rickety wooden bridge connecting it to the mainland. Heavy trucks could not pass over. As could be seen by the accident in 1971, when the bridge broke, this resulted in the new bridge being built. Construction starting in 1972, finishing two years later, and since then business has boomed for the tourism industry. This was helped by the motor racing circuit built there in the 1980s and the reputation for fresh seafood caught directly from the island's waters, and the famous native wildlife. Such as koalas and emus, although I would say, people being ruled by their stomachs, it is the food which really brings them in. Now the tour bus leaves quite early, six in the morning, and it's a long trip. But you'll really enjoy just looking at the beautiful scenery from the window. Still, we understand that you'll need to stretch your legs at some point. For this reason, we used to stop at the Emu Park Wildlife Sanctuary. 
until Arthur Island developed its own sanctuary, rendering that former stop-off somewhat redundant. Now we stop at the Bass Guest House next to the very interesting worm farm which you're invited to visit, thus learning all about those humble little creatures. And if you're interested in bigger wildlife, please remember that you'll need to pay the wildlife park entrance fee on the island, so budget for that. Another important point is not to eat too many of the complimentary biscuits with your free tea on the bus, since you should keep your appetite intact so that you can indulge in some of the great eateries on the island, for example, at the famous Reggie's Restaurant. Before you hear the rest of the talk, you have some time to look at questions 16 to 20. Now listen and answer questions 16 to 20. All right, you know about the history of Arthur Island and the details of our tour there, so let me now tell you a bit about the specific sites and attractions on the island itself. It's a small place, but there's a lot packed in there. If you want to cuddle a koala, the wildlife park is the first place to go. That's on the most easterly point, a small promontory sticking out into Bass Strait. But be careful, the wind can be very strong. Hold on to your hats, literally. By that time, you'll probably be ready to eat, and you could choose between Reggie's Restaurant or eating at the Nature Reserve, or at some of the restaurants right in the middle of the island. If it's Reggie's you want, take the complimentary bus down to the southern tip. Reggie's is right on the port taking its famous seafood directly from the boats. How fresh is that? But to save time, you could go northwards to the very opposite point of the island and eat at the restaurant in the nature reserve, then go and see the beautiful coastal scenery there. And what better way to do this than cycling? There are many trails, and Anderson's Beach also offers some beautiful opportunities for cyclists. As well as for swimming and surfing, of course. Get the bicycles, however, on the opposite side of the island, in the main township. Finally, you might want a reminder or souvenir of your trip. Obviously, there are souvenir shops all over the island, with many at Anderson's Beach. But the main spread of tourist shops is centrally located and right on the main road so that they are accessible to everyone, no matter where you are. Yes, at Arthur Island, you'll find everything you want to do and more. Now, do you have any questions? That is the end of section 2. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now turn to section 3. Section 3. You will hear two students, Sam and Liz, discussing a project for their marketing course. First, you have some time to look at questions 21 to 24. Now listen carefully and answer questions 21 to 24. Liz, I'm getting really worried about this marketing project we have to do together. Assessment is based on a single year-long project. Oh, don't worry, Sam. All it takes is appropriate planning. I used to work in finance and we always divided the year into quarters. 
So let's just do a quarter by quarter year long plan. Well, I intend to firstly interview people. I mean, we need raw data for this project, right? OK, that's your job. So we just need to coordinate my contribution so that we don't double up at the beginning. I can carry out the research on all the theoretical issues and background, for example. Well, why don't you do the summaries of the main texts as well? You know, write them up. Oh, I think we know those texts well enough already. And it's only optional anyway, so let's not bother with it. OK. Now, moving on to the second quarter of the year, I'll start collecting all the relevant information, the details, facts, and examples from my book reading, while you can do an analysis of the first-hand information you got from the interviews. OK. And then it's break time. I would say by then, mid-year, both you and I will have to decide on our point of view. And how we'll support it in the essay. And based on that, we can work together on designing an appropriate structure for the final writing, when we present everything. We'll need a bibliography, of course. I could do that in the third quarter, but since you did all the theoretical research, it would be a better job for you. We can do that at the very end of the year, but I'll make the preliminary list as I begin writing the essay proper. Meanwhile, you can begin sorting out the numerical data into easily readable formats. That's what the other students will be doing. You know, grouping statistics in tabular form or making graphical representations. And in the last quarter, we can proofread each other's work, allowing a different set of eyes to be involved. So I'll check your writing for any mistakes, typos or logical problems. I'm sure the essay will certainly benefit from such a thorough proofread. And I'll check all your tabulated statistics and graphs for the same issues. And then we'll just put it all together. Well, now it sounds far less scary. That's right. All you need is a clear, logical and coherent plan. Before you hear the rest of the conversation, you have some time to look at questions 25 to 30. Now listen and answer questions 25 to 30. As we discussed, Liz, my first task on this project is to get data using interviews, over 100 of them. To do that, I'll need to put a flyer on the university notice board to get volunteers. OK, just do that and we can start immediately. But I tried this last year and almost no one replied. The whole project was a failure as a result. You just need to ensure that the flyer is designed well. I did a course in design, so I can help you. I'm all ears. Well, one of the first rules, since the notice board will be full of papers, is to make sure your flyer stands out. Thus, don't use white paper. Use coloured paper. You mean like yellow paper? Yellow, red, orange, it doesn't matter, as long as it's coloured and thus more obvious. Similarly, make the heading attract people, and money does this, right? Well, sure. Everyone wants money. So don't say something boring such as help needed, but something such as easy money. That will immediately attract people's interest and also ensure they know that it won't take much time. These interviews are about half an hour, so tell them that right under the heading. Sounds good. Keep going. Well, by the same token, people don't have the time to read. They don't want to struggle through a large number of words. Thus, limit them. That will make the flyer easily and quickly read. Finally, there's a lot of false advertising and tricky people out there, so the readers might get suspicious, particularly when you're offering significant money for little work. You need to thus assure them that this is legitimate. So at the very top of the page, make sure you indicate that the scheme has been approved by the course convener. Just some writing saying this, but you should also add a signature. It doesn't matter who signs it. People don't read it anyway. In fact, you could even sign it yourself. Don't worry, I can get a legitimate signature. But you should definitely include a stamp, which is more reassuring to the readers. What sort of stamp? The department stamp. Some people put the university stamp, but to be honest, anyone can acquire that from the student union. A stamp from your department shows much more authenticity. 
and that way everyone will feel that the scheme is legitimate and hopefully be willing to give you a ring. So that's it? It's all finished? That's it, apart from the contact details at the bottom of the page, of course. Of course. Hey, that was some useful advice. I think a flyer like that will really draw them in. Thanks for that. No problem. That is the end of section 3. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now turn to section 4. Section 4. You will hear a lecturer discussing movie ratings. First, you have some time to look at questions 31 to 34. Now listen carefully and answer questions 31 to 34. One of the most popular pastimes all over the world is watching movies, whether that be at cinemas, at homes on the TV through commercial channels, or DVDs, or internet downloads. Given this popularity, it is clear that movies can influence the way people think and act, which is why there must necessarily be a motion picture rating system so that people are made aware in advance of the movie's content. The factors involved are bad language and the cinematic portrayal of sex, violence, drug use and antisocial or criminal behaviour. For example, virtually all countries will ban movies outright if the scenes involved glorify crime or show criminals getting away with their goods. Imagine, for example, a bank robbery film where the criminals end up retired in Brazil, living lives of luxury with their ill-gotten gains. Such a message may encourage impressionable young men to go and rob banks themselves, since it seems so easy. Thus, in all movies, crime inevitably leads to bad outcomes, in one way or another, be that prison, unhappiness or death. Yet there are still variations among countries. In Australia, for instance, it is the government which decides on the rating through a special review board, whereas in America, it is the movie industry itself which decides this through a trade association representing the major studios. Furthermore, different cultures may view movies in different ways. Sexual content is viewed more leniently in Europe, frowned upon in the West. Yet Western cinema often permits levels of violence which European cinema would never allow. And further complications come in when judging a movie within its historical context. For example, a war movie designed by its makers to be realistic will necessarily have graphic violence, which will often be permitted, providing it is not glorified in any way. Before you hear the rest of the lecture, you have some time to look at questions 35 to 40. Now listen and answer questions 35 to 40. Since America produces the bulk of the world's most watched movies, why don't we look in detail at their movie rating system? It begins with the innocent G rating, standing for general audience, allowing all ages, even very young children, into the cinema. The films are fun and community-oriented, with nothing which would be objectionable. 
they are often released for the summer holidays, when children are free from school. But if these movies have a mild element of violence or inappropriate and lewd humour, or some scary scenes, then it would be a PG movie, standing for Parental Guidance Needed. This PG rating comes in two forms, though. The weak version, a simple PG, or the strong version, PG-13. Most American movies are issued with this latter rating, since it allows the greatest proportion of the population to watch the movie, by which I mean children alongside their parents, while still allowing the movie itself to show society as it really is. Any rating higher than this will restrict children and limit viewership. In fact, if a movie, when shown to the Trade Association, fails to be issued with the PG-13, the offending scenes are often removed by the movie makers in order to secure this lower rating and ensure the greatest viewership. What all movie studios want to avoid is the R, or restricted rating. This means that younger children can only watch the film if accompanied by their parents, and many young teenagers simply don't want to do this. These films might have swearing, drug use or horror scenes with blood and gore. And if these images are particularly graphic, the rating is lifted to NC-17. NC means no children. In other words, the movie is for adults only. Since it is the younger market who are particularly intent on paying to see movies, many big cinemas simply don't bother showing NC films. There is simply little to no profit involved meaning that such films, often made by smaller independent film companies, are similarly released by independent theatres. Even then, these films only have what is known in the business as a limited theatrical release. That is the end of section 4. You now have half a minute to check your...